Okay, I'm delighted to welcome into studio again our man of Europe, a Europhile, I think it's true to say. You, well, love, you love matters European. I, I share this. I, the gorgeous flag showing our unity of nations in the blue background. Bernard Conlon, good to see you. Uh, hi, Rowan. Uh, thanks again for having me. Uh, <clears throat> Well, I certainly like things European, whether I like things all to do with the institutions, that's, a, that's another question. I love that good wine, that good food. <laughs> what a and, wise man. And in many respects, many European countries have much better weather than we generally yes. get. Yes, so there is a lot about Europe to be appreciated. It's culture, it's history, um, all those things are, what, are fascinating. What stays with you? You've been uh, out of Europe now, so to speak, professionally for a, for a time. But during all of your years there, what's the great memory? What is the kind of wow factor that makes you roar hallelujah when you think back on it? Um, well, my, I suppose my classic time, if I use that phrase in Europe, was there was a whole sequence of um, treaties going on. There was a huge amount of development. Uh, the pace of European integration was similar to that of uh, one of those French... Um, uh, high-speed trains mm. uh, the, over a relatively small period of time. I'm talking from about from about the late 80s to the early 2000s. Was it was it too fast, or did it have to be that fast to 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 actually benefit from the momentum of public opinion that wanted Europe, Europe, and more Europe? I think some things. Um, I suppose it needed a momentum. Europe, in a way, started after the Second World War. It, I think, I explained one time before, the European Union process integration was a kind of peace process between the, the likes of France and Germany in the wake of the Second World War. But there were some aspects where they were too fast. The euro was brought in with with great haste, mm. and you know the old expression. Um, um, do something in haste and repent in um, in a much slower yeah. haste. Yeah. And I think where there's a degree of, um, I suppose, considering that it was done too fast. Also, I think the the mingling of east and west has been something that, when I was in in Brussels, it was mainly 15 countries from Western Europe. So there were a lot of countries that had a lot of similarity mm -hmm. and a similar standard of living. Yeah. And so I suppose it was the European Union of Western Europe yes, in, yes. from the late 80s to the early 2000s until because 2004. If de Gaulle had said no to, to Britain, what in heaven's name would he say now to some of our new European uh, neighbours? He, he, he would have uh, steadfastly worked against them. Well, uh, sometimes when something gets too big, it becomes unmanageable. And I personally would have thought that um, a broader European Union, it may have been better to the six original countries that formed the European Union if they had become maybe a, a Germany and France and Benelux had formed some kind of federation so that the Commission itself would have been a, a more democratically accountable institution. And I think when, in the, the wake of the, the collapse of the Soviet Union, and um, it would have been a good idea for the former Soviet satellite countries to have formed some kind of union of their own, which would mm. have partnered with, with, Europe, with, yeah. with the, the European Union yes, and Western Europe. Yeah. It makes uh, a lot of sense, doesn't it? it yeah. I think that would have been more manageable. Um, I think we have a very wide, very broad, and... Um, very complicated Europe now. Why would we have, why would we have gone down the road of mingling uh, huge uh, opulence and affluence with, uh, with great poverty in the nations? Well, again, I think that's not dissimilar to the question about the euro. Uh, the euro, in theory, was a good idea, but it, you know, good ideas need to be piloted, prototyped uh, for a long time before they're actually implemented. There was a degree of indecent haste with the introduction of the euro, and we're now, um, as I say, we're um, we're ruining it. We're, we're in repenting yeah. in, in, at, at leisure. Yeah, um, yeah, it, it there. Was, um, But the it, there were, I think, people within the European Commission that wanted to to marry the two parts of Europe, East and West, very, very quickly, and 
Again, American interests wanted the two parts of Europe to be co-joined and amalgamated. Your, your idea seems to me an infinitely better idea, that you would have had, you would have had some kind of coalition of our new uh, former Soviet bloc countries, uh, that, uh, and that they would grow within their own context in association with Europe, leading, uh, leading almost to a moment when the apprenticeship would end and they would come into Europe. But we've got it now. We have to live well, with it. we've got it now. I think the years ahead, you know, there's no reason why progressive, interesting ideas shouldn't be proposed. Europe is still a work in progress. Mm. Um, we've, we saw we we're witnessing the hearings in the European Parliament going on this week, last week. And th th one of the big issues is Britain is Britain going to leave or not? And if Britain leaves, there's a planned and there's the possibility of a referendum in 2007. In Britain. In Britain. Mm. And the word that the concept of Britain leaving the European 2017. Union. 2017. Sorry, 2017. Yeah, so, sorry. Yeah. Um, there is, um, they're talking about in, in Brussels, they're now talking about Brexit. What which, is Bre uh, British exit? Brexit. Br British exit. So that will actually open up the whole notion once again of the formulation and structure of Europe. So there's nothing wrong with interesting, mm. maybe even wacky ideas being proposed. Mm. Um, you, you, know, um, you know, the notion of um, you know, even degrees of neutrality within Europe, mm -hmm. um, all of those ideas seem to have been pushed back. We've got a fairly singular, one-dimensional view of the European Union now, which is, seems to re revolve around one big market and a mono, a kind of mono, mono lot Europe yeah, are... Mon, mon, yeah, I understand what you're saying. Mm. The, um, what's in it for Northern Ireland at the moment? You, I know we have the Northern Ireland Task Force. Jim Nicholson has been speaking about it. He certainly uh, has. Yeah. What's the function of that task force for a start? Well, the task force, uh, basically, um, it is a group of... It's like a working group within the, within the European Commission. But as far as I know, uh, it brings in people from other um, institutions. Mm -hmm. I, I would imagine there's an input from the, the European Parliament um, and the Committee of the Regents, mm -hmm. and, uh, um, but it's mainly focused within the Commission. Um, it's headed by Commission officials. Um, the Commission official actually that um, certainly was spearheading it i'm not sure if he still is there it was it was a gentleman from dungannon mm -hmm. um it is basically to coordinate european union policies in relation to northern ireland and because the north got a large amount of money through peace and reconciliation mm -hmm. and very special budget lines like that there was a need, they believe there was a need for some kind of of working group or body within the particularly within the, the Commission, to coordinate and to, mm. to, to work on that. And as I say, Jim Nicholson asked um, the, the, the candidate for the regional policy portfolio, the Romanian lady, um, Madame Crenu, I think her, mm. name, Crenu, mm. her name is, would this task force continue? And she said it would. It would. Now, uh, that, that being the case, was, was that task force, did it find its genesis reaching out to Europe from Northern Ireland, or was it a European community thing in the interests of Northern Ireland, that it was generated, that it had its, its birth pangs within Europe rather than within Northern Ireland? I think a mixture of both, Rowan, yeah. actually. Um, if we go back to the period of the, the big personalities in local politics, when people like John Hume and uh, Ian Paisley, for example, were the two MEPs, um, well, Jim Nicholson has been probably the longest serving MEP, but when Hume and Paisley, and again along with Jim Nicholson, there was a tradition of proactive lobbying um, on, on behalf of this region. And um, that led to, um, as I say, special budget lines mm. such as Peace and Reconciliation, and we've had at least three programmes. Yeah. Uh, in terms what, what was, so, yes. The task force kind mm. of coordinates all that activity. Uh -huh. What was the process of bringing peace benefits? Obviously, there was a time when there was no such thing as peace one, two, three, five, whatever it is, nothing like that at all. But 
suddenly things began to ha begun to happen in, in Northern Ireland, and peace, uh, we set out on the road to peace. Was there a moment within Europe that they said, we are pleased at what we see, we are now going to introduce something that will enhance the process and nurture it. Was that the way it happened? I, th I think that's a fair enough comment. I think that's an interesting comment. I think the, the genesis or the origins of the concept of special funding, um, um, such as peace and reconciliation, um, came with Jack Delors. Mm. Uh, Jack Delors was a former president of the European Commission. Million name. Um, yes, um, he was the president of the European Commission through most of the 90s. Um, I can't remember when he actually came into office. It may have been in, at the tail end of the 80s. Yes, but yes. he was there for a large part of the 90s. And he was a very visionary European commissioner. He mm. was French. He was a, a French socialist. And he had a, a more... I suppose a, a social um, and market-led vision for Europe that the social was just as important as the market. Yes, yes, yeah. um, and the peace and reconciliation program process seemed to emanate from his thinking. Yes. Interventionist and the peace process was obviously going on throughout the 90s in this part of the world. And I think Delors and the Commission wanted to make their contribution. And I think it was a contribution designed on that kind of thinking of both a social Europe and a, mar a market-driven mm. Europe where the two strands mm -hmm. were, um, yes. um, were coordinated and played an active role. Mm -hmm. Can you conceive of a Northern Ireland, and, we, and there's the Republic of Ireland, uh, without Europe? Um, if Britain goes, obviously we go. Right, right. Well, obviously, uh, you know, if um, we're in the United Kingdom, so if Britain leaves, we leave. Um, that will, um, I can't imagine the Republic leaving. No, no. Um, no. It seems that the political class in the Republic have vested, invested very heavily in the European dimension. They're proud. They're more, they're more proud down there to be European than we are, is it? I don't know if it's pride. I think there's the political system, the political um, system in the Republic has become much more just embedded and integrated in the European process. I mean, the, the bailout after the financial crisis has very much locked the Republic into a European process. Um, there, was, there has been some talk that the Republic suffered a loss of sovereign, yeah. sovereignty as a result of the bailout that it received mm. from yeah. the European Commission, European Central Bank and the International Monetary Fund. Mm. So to some extent, having to um, process and deal with that, um, that bailout, I guess, has even locked the Republic deeper into mm -hmm. the... Um, into the, the hands of things like the European Central Bank, which is based in Frankfurt. But those banks, you see, the Central Bank and the European Community, they must ultimately have a great deal of confidence in the Republic of Ireland that they're willing to go down the bailout road. Um, well, uh, there were other countries that got bailouts, Greece, um, Portugal. Um, Ireland seems to be better been, than most of them it, in managing the bailout. It, it, it has, I guess, um, the government in the Republic was very focused. Um, it, you know, it, it, looking back historically now, we just wonder, look, like, why did the Republic get into such a mess? Mm -hmm. There was a huge borrowing by Irish banks from, from German banks. Yes. Yes. And really, to no great purpose, they were mm. basically inflating the price of Irish property and Irish land. Yeah. But there were obviously people in Ireland who were doing well from that. Um, but yes, the Republic has been very focused in actually tr trying to conform to the, um, to the terms and conditions mm. that the Troika, which is three bodies that I mentioned, mm -hmm. that um, spearheaded the, uh, the bailout, so the Republic has been a, a good pupil, so to mm. speak. Yep. Um, and, but the Republic is a small, very open economy. It's very export driven. Um, it basically is one of those small economies that seeks to provide a service base 
for large international companies. Mm -hmm. So I guess the, the economic model that the Republic's government has fostered mm -hmm. um, motivated, mm -hmm. it, motivated it to actually remedy the, uh, yeah. the, the I suppose, the reputation damage it yeah. suffered as a result. They, they, they've almost brought <laughs> austerity into the lexicon of beautiful words. Yes. They've almost made it attractive yes. to be austere. Yes. Yes, well, there's a, there seems to be a cult of austerity, not just in the Republic, but again in Britain and in many other parts of Europe. I mean, Ger um, Italy and Italy, Greece, Portugal and Spain, uh, we don't hear so much about it now, but mm. all of these countries are suffering dreadfully from austerity. Right, yes. I mean, the, the levels of youth unemployment in countries mm. like Spain and Greece, just horrendous. horrendous yeah. And there, there seems to be almost a, a cult and, uh, of, of austerity mm. that has become part of the European Union um, brand. Finally today, Bernard Conlon, if you could tell us the very best thing for us being European. Why, what's, what's the greatness of it? Well, I think Europe will evolve, Rowan. I don't think the Europe that we have today is going to be the Europe we're going to have in 10 years' time or 20 years' time. I think it will evolve. I think that Britain is going to have a, a, a referendum in 2017. Um, uh, so I think there'll be I think the citizen will get more involved in configuring Europe. I think the citizens of Greece, of Spain and Portugal, Italy, I think all of those citizens are, will have been activated by the experience of austerity. And I think there is the relationships between the Eastern countries like Poland and Ukraine and, and, and Russia, that's a debate that's opening up. Mm. They have to have a relationship with, the for, you know, with their old boss in the Soviet Union. And that, as, as indeed perhaps all of Europe needs to have. Well, absolutely. I think in, a, in a Europe in 20 years' time, we could have a very different one from the one now. I, I think the, the Europe just defined by a market will will need to be replaced by a Europe where there's there is um, social uh, mm. agendas, environmental agendas. We need to coordinate, but we also need to we also need to appreciate the you know the diversity on the ground. I mean, countries or regions like Catalan mm. um, are looking for you know f for the possibility of greater uh, um, autonomy, maybe mm. even independence. So I think. We have a broad, um, a broad tapestry, a broad canvas to paint on, okay. and it's up to the citizen to be the painter and the artist, not not the, uh, not the small groups of people who are designing the legislation in in institutions. It's the citizen who should be king. So Europe, with a citizen king, is ultimately the feel good factor. That is the Europe. That is what I, the vision that I have and hope for. God bless you. Thank you. <laughs>